want for us to just pick up some words, but just before you stand with me for God's word, and it's just two verses. In Matthew chapter 13, there is this at the end of one of the parables. Uh, I thought I had it here. Whoops, that wasn't the one. It says that he spoke to them in parables and um, there it is, verse 34. Chapter 13, verse 34. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. Now there's a reason for doing that. The parable is a little story that is easy to remember because you can remember the story and so you could go home and you could tell it to your family at supper and you could tell it to the group that you have coffee with the next morning at the coffee shop because it's a story that's easy to remember. When I was in seminary, they told me that a parable is a story used as an illustration to to illustrate a truth. But I picked up a better definition than that recently that I really like. Someone said that a parable is an engaging story that captures you. It reaches out and grabs your imagination, your interest, your focus, and if you will stare at it, you will see yourself in it. But if you keep staring at it, you'll see God in it also. And so I come to you this morning with that thought in my mind about the parables of Jesus. Two verses today from Matthew 13, verse 51 and 52. If you have it, would you stand with me and let's, let's get it before us. After a parable... Jesus starts, have you understood all these things? Jesus asked. Yes, they replied. He said to them, therefore, every teacher of the law who has been instructed about the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasure as well as old. Now, isn't that an odd parable for Jesus to use with his disciples? Father, we're going to need your help. Jesus, you promised that the Holy Spirit would not only remind us of what you said, but would teach us all things. And so I'm going to trust that today your Holy Spirit will come and minister to us in a teaching ministry that will enable us to understand deeply, not just with our heads, but with our hearts. And may we enjoy the privileges of the kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, strange. Have you understood? Oh yeah, I understand. I understood some things when I was five. I understood other things when I was seven. I knew it all by the time I was 13. Didn't you? Guy said, <clears throat> the problem with studying is I keep learning more about less. I started out lear- knowing a lot about a little, and as I have learned more about less, I find that I know all about nothing. <laughs> And then Jesus comes and says, have you understood? Oh, yeah, I understand. Well, let me explain it to you. And then, and then he gives us this little gem. Every teacher of the law who has been instructed, what is the instruction from the law? The instruction from the law involves the kingdom of God. Oh, yeah, I remember. We always want to have the kingdom of David restored. No, 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 no. It's about the rule of God. 
it's not about whether it's Romans or whether it's Egyptians or whether it's Hebrews. It's about allowing God to rule in the heart. And if you allow God to rule in his heart, then these are the guidelines of how to live well. We call them Ten Commandments. The word in the Hebrew, tzion, is a sign. It's a sign that says water, quarter of a mile. Green pasture, a half a mile. This direction, that direction. That's what tzion is. So you want to live well? This way. You want to live better? That way. And that's what it is. So <clears throat> the kingdom of heaven is like, as you do this, it's like looking at treasure. And so he has this concept of new treasures as well as old treasures. Wow. I, I wanted to show you, but you know, I live a long ways from here, and so I don't know why it is that God always gives me the thought of what I could show you after I am a hundred and some miles from home, you know, but that happens. Probably happened to you once or twice too. I have in a drawer of my desk, uh, in a little bag, a bracelet of turquoise, little pieces of turquoise that Mayans in antiquity strung together for a bracelet. It was given to me by a person who found them in the forest and he said I want to give this to you because I value our friendship more than I value this it's just a simple ancient little bracelet of poor quality turquoise I showed it to somebody who knew what he was talking about and he said Pastor Ron if you were to sell that you would have money to buy a very nice home. That is extremely valuable. Oh, that's one of my old treasures. Now I went down to Harbor Freight the other day and I got a new treasure. Y'all understand what I'm talking about? And in my house I have both old treasures and new treasures. It would be fun for you to come and for me to show you some of my old treasures. It'd be fun for us to have a cup of coffee and for me to share with you some of my new treasures because I am still enjoying receiving new treasure. But let's get into it. What did Jesus mean? Who are the ones who have been trained in the law? And why is it that training in the law always involves the kingdom? Now, that wasn't supposed to happen that way. That's supposed to happen like this. Now, why don't you pay attention to what I'm trying to do here, computer? There's a series of parables that precede this. One is called the parable of the hid treasure. And so in that one, we have illustrated the joy of the surprise of the discovery of something very valuable. So the story is that in a field, a man ran across some buried treasure, and he left it there and went and, and bought the property so that he would own the treasure. But the, the story is about the surprise and joy in finding something valuable that was worth everything else he owned. There's another parable. We call it the parable of the of the pearl of great price and and this one is the recognition of opportunity if I could buy this pearl I could sell it and I would be able to retire handsomely and so there's opportunity that lies in this discovery and the parable is beautiful and then now we come to this one so at the conclusion of these two parables Jesus asks his disciples do you understand do you understand these things? Well, what things? Do you understand about hidden treasure? No. Do you understand about pearls? No, that's not what it's about. It's about the kingdom of God. Do you understand about the kingdom of God? So I come to this, and, and I picked up a chart, maybe kind of hard for you to, to read, but, I, I, but it's good. The capacity to learn is a gift. 
the ability to learn is a skill. Wow, that's interesting, isn't it? One more step. The willingness to learn is a choice. Now, God has given us something. We hone the skill, but we have to choose to use it. And I, I get to thinking about that, and when Jesus comes on the scene and asks the question, do you understand all three levels of this go to work? So, I come, you come, with a measure of capacity to learn, a measure of ability to understand. The question then is, are we willing to understand? So the first thing that I, I want to float out of this is, is this challenge. Be informed. You and I are to be disciples of Jesus. The question is, are we informed disciples? I am working with a pastor up, at, um, <clears throat> up in uh, Brewster. And uh, man, he has a heart for God that is just amazing. His his prayer life, his uh, love of the scriptures is enviable. But he has had no ministerial training. He's a blank sheet of paper. I teach ministerial classes. I believe that God wants me to help this man in his educational process. But book study, book learning is not his forte, I'll have to tell you. The man, does he have a passion for God? And as I have listened to God in what I'm focusing as an assignment to disciple this man, I do not want to dampen his spirit in any way. Randy uh, this morning was saying, man, I love Jose. He's, oh, what a man. And he has a great heart. Wouldn't it be awful to spoil that? And yet, somewhere along the way, to be a disciple of Jesus and take all of the stuff that we had learned in the synagogue school and to have it live and to have it be real wisdom. Man, to sit at the feet of Jesus day after day. What a privilege. Well, wait a minute. You and I have that privilege. So Jesus says then, every teacher of the law, all right, those of us that are parent, our parents have been that, those of us that have done some kind of ministry in the church, or do those of us that are witnesses for God to somebody, a neighbor or anybody, do that. Every teacher of the law, and then what? Who has been instructed in the kingdom of heaven. So I find that many times we've been instructed, but we've instruct, been instructed about history. We've been instructed about uh, details and words and meanings and all that stuff, but we need to be instructed about God's rule in our hearts. So I want to, I want to tell you, this, this gets focused pretty tight. So Jesus spoke in this parable to people steeped in covenant history. They knew that God had made a covenant with Abraham and that it had been renewed with his people many times and that Mount Sinai was one of the big events. They knew what a covenant relationship God looked like, and they had a lot of stories about God, how God had kept his people and fed his people and protected his people and whatever else. And you and I may come with some knowledge about the Old Testament, and maybe we really don't know much about the Old Testament. I'm finding that my, my colleagues in clergy uh, today know very little about the Old Testament because they've, they've been told that it has been replaced by the New Testament. Well, wait a minute. The Old Testament was the Bible Jesus used. It can't be too bad. But all of us know enough about what God expects to be able to live well and to be able to do what he says so that our life can have blessing. Now, I'm not propagating a works righteousness in any way. I'm just saying that God gives us instructions in order to help us live well and not do damage somehow. So here Jesus comes saying to the Jewish people that he was, he was working with, your heritage and the Old Testament helps you understand. You have a lot of old treasures. 
You can talk about the Red Sea experience. You can talk about manna. You can talk about the giving of the Ten Commandments. You can talk about how God blessed King David. You can talk about all of these. You have old treasures in your storehouse that you can bring out. Now, as you spend time with Jesus, there's a new understanding and a new revelation about the kingdom. The kingdom isn't a nation of Israel. It isn't 12 tribes in the wilderness. It is the hearts of individuals, and it involves the rule of God. So everywhere Jesus went, he was preaching good news. And Matthew says it's good news of the kingdom of heaven. Matthew uses kingdom of heaven, where the others call it kingdom of God. Uh, Matthew was too Jewish to use the word God, the name of God, so he calls it the kingdom of heaven. But we're talking about the rule, that which God wants to rule. It's the heart. And it's not abusive, it's a loving rule that he wants to do. So <clears throat> people, both Old and New Testament, have always marveled at the mighty works of God, the power, the wisdom, all of that. But it's not always just words and facts. The interesting thing about what God is doing is this demonstration of power and life. It's the demonstration of blessing on his people in a covenant relationship. So the best way to learn the value of the Old Testament and to gain new treasure <laughs> is to hang out with Jesus. Isn't that that's pretty simple, isn't it? I went over to Mozambique uh, a couple of years ago, and I had the privilege of uh, teaching 400 pastors. And, you know, they come to this conference. I'm going to get some chicken and rice, and, man, this is going to be good. And I get to go from home for a while and be with everybody. And so they come to the conference, and they're sitting there kind of like, who are you? Where do you come from? And, and I don't have any better sense than just tell them what God says. So I opened the Bible and just started talking to them. Have you, have you seen? Do you understand? Do you understand what you're reading? And they said, well, sure we understand. I started showing them and never saw that before. Wow, never saw that before. About 20 minutes into it, these preachers, have got a, they, they came wide awake. Oh, this is different. This is not the promotion of a program. Wow, this is good. And they woke up. <laughs> the second day in the middle of the afternoon, one old guy said, man, this is the best stuff I've ever gotten in on. But you didn't even tell us your name. Who are you anyway? <laughs> and said, not about me. It's about the king and what he has to say. So it's not important who I am. What's important is what he says. And I really believe that. And I believe that as you and I hang out with Jesus, listen, learn, and obey, we become very wise. So, I think that each of us needs to commit to be with him, to learn from him how to be like him. That's the definition of a disciple, incidentally. That's pretty good stuff. And that's how you gain instru instruction about the kingdom of heaven, living with Jesus. What a privilege. So back to this. The capacity to learn is a gift. The ability to learn is a skill. And the willingness to learn is a choice. What a deal. Let's try a second one, a second point out of this. You know, preachers have to have three points, and when you only have two verses to work with, it's hard to find three points. Stick, stick around a little bit. Let's do it. I think we need to learn how to prize what's in our storeroom. And I believe that every one of us has treasure in our store, storeroom. So Jesus says, like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasure as well as old. So in the Jewish tradition, the storeroom is a person's heart. So what do I have in my heart? What do you have in your heart that would be a treasure? Well, it's out of our understanding that we bring the treasure then, uh, and it's a mix of knowledge and facts and, and the mighty works of God. If you and I were to sit down and have a cup of coffee, we could talk about miracles that God has done in our life. I can tell you, I can tell you things that are absolutely unbelievable. This week I have heard stories of what God has done that are phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. 
God is at work in our day. <clears throat> these facts and these events that you and I are aware of need to be enlivened by revelation. God wants to show us how important, how valuable some of these little things are that he has given us. They're treasure. And sometimes we didn't see them as treasure, but they really are. The product then becomes understanding, and God wants us to understand. So he asked the disciples who are listening to him and listening to him talk, do you understand? And so have you been through the process of all of this? So treasures are the life-changing, decision-influencing proofs. You know, when I was a young man, <coughs> I... Um, my parents were in Africa. I was um, staying with an aunt and uncle while I finished my high school education. And they went to a different, uh, a church of a different denomination than mine. And so that's where the family car went. So I, I worshiped with them. I became a part of that church. When I was a senior in high school, the pastor of that church said to me, Ron, I want you to preach on a Sunday night. Well, wait a minute. God hasn't called me to preach. He said, I want you to preach. Sunday night, such and such a date, you're on with a sermon. I want you to get ready. I said, man, I don't even have a typewriter. Somebody, he said, I'll loan you one. He loaned me a typewriter that has the smallest type I have ever seen. Just my size. Man, I love this microfilm stuff. So I borrowed that typewriter, and I wrote myself out a little sermon. I have to tell you, it was funny. Paul, you'd, you'd appreciate this. I preached that night. I preached everything there was to preach on both salvation and sanctification out of everything from Genesis to Revelation. Man, I burned it all up, and I looked at my watch, and it was 13 minutes into the sermon. And I was done. Man, there wasn't any more scripture to use and there wasn't any more to talk about. I'm done. What do you do when you're done? So I gave an altar call and man, people came to the altar. It was, it was kind of scary, you know. Wow, a few words and they respond. The little lady said afterwards, said, uh, Ron, are you going to be a preacher? No, God hasn't called me to preach. You'd sure make a good preacher. No, God hasn't called me to preach. You know, I bounced through life a long ways before I learned to listen to what God was trying to say through little old ladies. You, you all understand what I'm talking about? You know, sometimes the people in your life can speak to you, but God had to give me some proofs that he was calling me to ministry because I was just too hard-headed to get it. I, I, you could call it pride, you could call it fear, you could call it selfish, you could call it anything you want to. I, I just couldn't get that God was calling me to full-time Christian service. But I finally surrendered to that, and rather than trying to crowd that square peg in that round hole, everything just fit from then on. My finances worked out, my schedule worked out, it was just totally different from then on. And I can go back and I can show you, not only in that dimension, but in several dimensions of my life, the things that God has said, the things that I have learned, have become living proofs of his will in my life. Those are new treasure to me. <clears throat> what things convinced you to believe that Jesus is God? What convinced you that if you believed him, if you trusted him with your life, you would have joy and purpose and hope and the things that really matter. You see, each of us has proofs somewhere that are the new treasure that God wants us to bring out of the storehouse and share with someone else. So <clears throat> there is somewhere of what we call certitude, that just means that you're sure of something, and conviction and these things become treasures. So someone will ask you, like Jerry was saying about the book that Ravi Zacharias just wrote, how do you know that God is real? How do you know that trusting him is better than some other way? How do you know? And each of us has a treasure to show at that point. Here's how I know. <clears throat> it's 
in the storeroom that the Jewish people thought of as the heart. So the truths of God's word are hidden in our heart. It may have been direction when we were young, maybe in a decision in later years of life. It may be an insight. It may even be a correction where you were doing something and God said, don't do it that way anymore. Don't do that anymore. Been working with a man that's um, had a tobacco habit, and uh, you know, I think I think that stinks, and uh, it just I don't like the smell of an ashtray, and a lot of people smell like an ashtray, and I just you know, I've, I have trouble breathing in a restaurant where there's a lot of smoke, or in a car that has been smoked in. I, it just it's difficult for me. I guess I have some lung, lung damage in part, but it's just difficult for me. So this man was a heavy smoker, and he always just reeked of tobacco. And I have been working with him. He committed to God, and he's been working with God. One day he came to me recently and said, Ron, I'm tobacco-free. And I said, really? Yeah, he said, I didn't struggle with it. I didn't, uh, I didn't fight it. <clears throat> I, didn't, uh, I didn't give it up as some kind of a great sacrifice that I was making to God. He said, you know, one day God spoke, and he said, it's time for, me to, it's time for you to just give me your tobacco habit. And he said, in this loving relationship with all the mercy and all the grace that I experienced, it was so easy just to give it to him. And I no longer crave the tobacco. And I thought, wow, what a beautiful story. How simple. I have to tell you that I have, on occasion in my youth, tried to tell somebody to quit and how to quit, and that didn't work nearly as well as just letting God tell somebody. You understand what I'm saying? And it isn't just that. You know, there are other things. All of us have something that God may want to deal with us about, but there's some memories of the miracles that God has done. You have these. We sometimes share those, but those are the treasures that we bring out of our storehouse. There's an awareness of the times that God has been so real, so present, or that he has spoken so clearly. I had somebody just this week saying, uh, somebody asked me, uh, do you, oh, it was Julene, talking, on tele- uh, talking with a neighbor. She was saying, I believe that God spoke to me and said, and uh, the neighbor said, how do you hear God talk? I have never heard God say anything. So Julene had to explain to her, she said, Dad, I've never had to do that before. But this lady wanted to know how I heard God, and I just shared with her a struggle that I had and how God has spoken so clearly, and as I shared it, she, all of her argument was gone. Oh, that's how God speaks. You see, those are the treasures, the new treasures that we need to share. The third thing is that... <clears throat> We're ne- we need to value both the new treasure and the old. So like the owner of the house that brings out both old treasure and new, you see, Jesus' hearers had been steeped in the old treasures, the Old Testament, the law and the prophets, the great miracles that God had done in a previous day, and uh, <clears throat> they thought they had a great heritage in being the people of God and having as a as a nation experienced these great and mighty works of God. And they had wonderful promises of a, of a promised land and of a Messiah and all that stuff. But more than national pride and hope, something current and real they did not have. So you and I enjoy a storehouse that has not only the biblical history, and, and the past blessings that others have enjoyed and that we have enjoyed. But St. Paul says that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. We have it in an old clay pot that may be cracked or cancerous or whatever, you know, maybe wrinkled, I don't know, whatever, whatever it is. We also have the testimony of others. I am hearing testimonies these days of the mighty things that God is doing that are, ap- they're the kind of things I hear about that happen in Africa. And people say, Why don't they happen in America? They're happening right now here in America. It's awesome. So for folk in Jesus' day, the new treasures involved this new revelation that Jesus came along teaching about the kingdom. And it wasn't just the old stuff that they had been hearing in the synagogue. This was live. This was real. And it was present tense. And it was personal. 
And Jesus was teaching things that delighted their hearts, and he spoke with authority and not like the scribes and Pharisees. He always taught in parables so that they could remember it, so that they could see themselves and see God in it. And they began to believe in him. They watched him exercise power over sickness and demons and death and nature and all of the things that he was doing. They were impressed. This must be the Messiah. Of course, he got himself killed and that wiped everything out. And the resurrection put it all back together. You and I today have new treasure of the more recent things that God has done. I, I heard the other day on the news that there's a revival going on in Iran. Have you heard about that? They don't have any property, they don't have any churches, they don't have any salaries, they don't have any leaders, they don't have any 501c3 exempt tax exemptions, and the government doesn't know where to lop the thing off. They can't, they can't get it stopped, but, but Christianity is just, just flooding Iran today. Man, that's a tough country. And God is at work there. I've heard some similar stories about some other places, absolutely phenomenal, but do you know that on our military bases in the United States there's a revival going on? Milita our military boys and girls are coming to Jesus by the thousands today in America. Oh, I could tell you a story. I was just with a group of pastors last week on Tuesday, and they were talking about the miracles that God is doing among their people. I'll tell you what, these are exciting days to be alive. This is all new treasure.
Good day, Miss Flaff. You are looking mighty fine today. What are you doing that seems to be so much fun? Well, hello, Mr. Pickles. I decided that today would be a good day to get ready to go to heaven. So I came to town to see if I can buy a new dress. I can see how it might be fun to buy a new dress. But are you planning to go to heaven soon? Well, Pastor Ron was preaching on the goal of redemption today, and I just figured that it might be a good idea to get ready to go to heaven. You know, Mr. Pickles, getting us all to heaven is the goal of redemption. Well, I believe that heaven is a real place and that all of us ought to want to go there. But I didn't understand Pastor to be speaking about going to heaven. Well, the title of his message was about the goal of redemption. Isn't that heaven? I guess that, in a sense, it is. But Pastor Ron's message involved the ways in which God wants to get all of us ready to go to heaven and be comfortable when we get there. Oh, yeah. I guess that's where I got the notion that I ought to find a nice dress so that I will be ready to go. I've been thinking that surely God would want me to look nice in heaven. You know, I haven't given much thought to what kind of clothes folks will wear in heaven or where they'll get them if they need clothes. Oh, Mr. Pickles, it wouldn't be right for people to be running around heaven without clothes. Why, the very thought of it. You're right, I guess. But what Pastor was sharing with us involved our character. You know, things like uprightness, Christian perfection, and confidence. Character qualities like these flow from who we are rather than from what we wear. Mr. Pickles, I do walk around upright. But when I'm wearing a nice dress, I tend to stand straighter and I walk around with more poise, I think. I don't think I'll ever get to perfection. I have a birthmark on my back that I've always hated. But it doesn't show when I'm wearing a nice dress. I see. So, do you feel that if you wear a nice dress in heaven, you will feel comfortable in God's holy home? And will you feel comfortable in God's presence? Wow, that's really scary to think about. I would be so nervous. I don't know, Mr. Peckles. I'm not sure I would feel comfortable, but I sure know I wouldn't want to be wearing my shorts. You see, Miss Flaff, the reason Pastor lifted out that passage of Scripture this morning was to help us see that the God who saves us really wants us to be comfortable in his holy home. So we need to learn how to live well here and now upright, without blemish, and confident. The wonderful thing is that God himself will help us develop those things. Okay, I get it. All that really would be better than a new dress, I guess. But I think I'll still buy one. <laughs>